Hi everybody, it is Tom and Monica at <laughs> Oh hi. At Good Now Farms Chocolate. How are you? Hi. Thanks for tuning in. Yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so uh yeah, we are here to give you guys a tour of our chocolate factory. We're gonna give you a tour of the process from start to finish. Um we're starting here at the beginning and we're gonna end where we have uh completed bars. So uh, first of all, many thanks to the folks at FCCI um, and Uncommon Cacao and the Craft Chocolate Experience for putting this festival together so thanks, quickly. Guys. It is really awesome to do that and um, it's really helpful for everybody. And to everybody who's joining us, we wanted to say that please, if you have questions as we go through this, um, please ask and we will do our best to answer everything. So. Yeah. I think that we're just one of the stories in a whole assortment of, um, of coverage. So today, tomorrow, and the next day, there are going to be a lot of stories from a lot of different chocolate makers, cacao growers, people in the supply chain, chocolatiers, all these kinds of people that make awesome stuff with chocolate. So make sure you look at the calendar and stay home with chocolate. Yeah, go to the website, stay home with chocolate, and there's a whole schedule of uh, who's coming up yep. the rest of the day today and tomorrow. Yeah. So, hey Zach's Chocolate, <laughs> Arizona's joining us, hey guys. Awesome. Um, so, thank you everybody for joining us. So we're going to step through the whole process, we're going to start um, from Bean and end up at Bar. So, yep. we're going to start here, go alright, <laughs> we're going to start here in our former garage. This is used to used to be um, where we parked our cars, but now it's nothing but cacao beans. So, Sorry, this is all backwards. So, if you see all these barrels here, this is where we store our cacao beans. Now, because we make chocolate at our farm. We make chocolate at our farm. So, people, I should start by saying, people always ask, why is it called Good Now Farms chocolate? Yeah. That's because we are actually here on a farm, 225 year old farm um, in Sudbury, Mass. And it was owned for a very long time by the Good Now family. Yeah. Hence the name Good Now Farms. Yeah. So, if you see, I don't know if we can do this, but if you look oh, yeah. just outside the window here, you can see that's the barn. So we're actually right next to the barn is where we make our chocolate. It's actually adjacent. It's a building adjacent to the barn. Yes, so. not in the barn. Not in the barn. Don't worry. Barn's uh, intact. Yes, lots of bats in the barn. Okay. <laughs> so All right. Hopefully let's, not, no. let's not go there. <laughs> let's just... So anyway, um, we start... We, the beans start here. However, hey, Uncommon Cacao, um, we actually always start at the source. So Monica and I travel to each place we source our beans from. We feel that's really important because where you get the beans from makes a big difference in flavor. Yeah. So I know probably most of the people who are, um, hey guys, um, who are checking into this have a working knowledge of single origin chocolate, so we won't belabor that point. We usually go through that quite a bit, but just in short, what we do is make single origin chocolate, which is taking beans from one location, one farm, making bars only from those beans. And the reason for that is because different beans have different genetics, and the terroir also has a big impact on the flavor. All those, the genetics, the terroir, how it's fermented and dried at the origin, all impact flavor. So yeah. each different bean we have has a very different flavor. So yeah. that's what we're going for and here. And it's really flavor. important that we know the farmers and that they're committed to the same high quality processes that we rely on to be able to make our fine flavor chocolate. So uh, once we get the beans, they're fermented and dried at the source. So um, I think you guys know Chocolate comes from a fruit, it's a pod, it looks something like this. It looks exactly like this actually. Those are from Nicaragua. And then those pods are cut open and inside the pods are the beans, which are the seeds, and that's what we use to make our chocolate. So that has to be fermented and dried though. So the, the wet beans and the pulp, that's called baba, it has to be fermented to really develop flavor and also to get rid of certain things you don't want in terms of flavor. So the fermentation happens at the source. You can't transport it up here because the second you pick it it starts to to be in I'm not sure how to do that whoever just asked to be in our live video <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry. so um, so once, as, yeah, as soon as you cut the cacao pod from the tree and you open up the fruit the fruit is exposed to oxygen and it immediately starts to ferment so it's then brought to the fermentation boxes they're fermented about a ton at a time that's a fermentation box in Nicaragua RL Carmen beans if, if you're watching, you know that very well. Um, you have to ferment them in about a ton at a time. Mm -hmm. um, that's why a lot of farmers typically will get together and aggregate their beans. Also, it takes a lot of skill to do that. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of groups who are now working in Central and South America to help um, tra uh, transfer that knowledge to the farmers and the groups that are down there doing it 
Um, we'll talk more about that later. And we specifically work with farmers in the Americas, and it's not because we don't like cacao from other parts of the world. Honestly, um, it's easiest for us to have that direct relationship with farmers there because we speak Spanish, so we can talk to them easily. So we work with farmers in Mexico, Central America, and South America. All right, so then the final step is just drying. So after they're fermented, they're dried. And those are the big uh, drying boxes, ideally not in the sun. All of this has a, a big impact in flavor. So how it's done, of course, makes a big difference. So what we've done, we know we're only supposed to have 30 minutes here. So okay. to get through the process, what we've done is we've taken a few of our beans and we're gonna show you the beans side by side and then do a cut test. And that'll show you the difference on uh, the beans on yeah. the inside, because outside yeah. there's a shell and you can't see the the nibs quite as well. But so first show them the whole garage they can see how we store them. So Come this is here. how, we, yep, this is how we store them. They're in barrels and they're yeah, in food safe plastic bags and they are right here. These are the beans. These right here are the Asa uh, um actually no, these are Asa Chibite beans. So Emily, Uncommon Cacao, if you guys are watching, these are from a small village in Guatemala called San Juan Chibite and they're fermented and dried specifically for us. They harvest beans from a certain number of farms because we're looking for a certain flavor profile and they use a special fermentation and drying protocol for us to get the flavors we want yeah and stacy's here hey. stacy hi stacy is it stacy or stacy it's stacy i thought it was stacy let's, let's move on okay so <laughs> anyway guys um over here is where once okay let's show the beans so these are a few of our origins and i know for some ridiculous reason on instagram all the words are backwards but this is our almendra blanca that's mexico Esmeraldas is Ecuador, El Carmen is Nicaragua, Ucayali, Peru, and Asa Chivite is Guatemala, we were just talking about. So this isn't all of them, but this is what we could grab really quickly to show you some variety. So you can just see a, you know, a little bit of difference. The visual difference doesn't probably come through as much on the video, um, but you can see they are different, slightly different shapes, um, different sizes, different colors. That's a function of the genetic differences, also the way they were fermented. Now what we're going to do is, Monica can hold the, yep. there we go, um, we're going to do a cut test for you. So that's what we do, we get the beans into our farm here so we can open them up and see, basically this tells you how well they were fermented. That's like a guillotine. So it's a, a bean guillotine, so rather expensive piece of, <laughs> piece of equipment. So this will cut the beans in half, and I did that wrong. Ideally, one smooth cut. So you open it up. Hold on, I'm coming, I'm coming. And then inside, this will give you a much better idea of the differences between the beans. So let me open this. So what we have here is... I got it. Got it. The bottom three rows are our almendra, and then these here are esmeraldas, and these up here are the asachivite. So you can see much more purpley for the asachivite. It's a bit of a lighter fermentation. Uh, esmeraldas. This color right here is really an ideal. These guys do a great job. It's one family farm in Ecuador, and they have hand-picked their varietals so they can ferment and dry specifically to that on their own farm. They have their own fermentation. Really good fermentation. This is Almendra Blanca from Mexico. As you can see, genetically, these are much lighter beans. So it's a very different process for evaluating whether or not they're fermented or not. That's also why if you look at this bar, it's the same cacao percentage as our other bars, but much lighter in color because the beans are much lighter. So, all right, let me make sure we didn't miss any questions here so Two far. questions? I think we're good. If we have questions, ask again, because I'm sorry, we might have missed it. We're trying our best. <laughs> all right, so basically, um, once we're ready to make chocolate, we come down here and we will take our beans, we'll sort the beans on these sorting trays. That's to get rid of any flat beans, broken beans, small beans that won't roast well. The detritus falls down into here, and then any of the bad beans we uh, put in the container and throw out. So then once they're done, yeah. I, <laughs> uh, we put them in these hydroponic buckets, 15 pounds at a time, and then Pretty two much. buckets will go upstairs to be roasted, the next step in the process, because our roaster fits 30 pounds of beans. So okay. up we go. Here right. we go. Uh, this, is where you, this is where you want editing. All right, so we're in our chocolate kitchen. Here, I'll I'm, do I'm gonna actually put on a hat. Okay. I look ridiculous in here. So food safety. Gotta cover the hair. So these are available on our, web, on our website. What does it say? Good enough for us. There you go. All right, I'm gonna put on some gloves too. So I'm gonna show you the chocolate kitchen. You got it? All right, so 
This is our chocolate kitchen here. We're um, right now. We don't have anybody in the kitchen. It's just us um, for safety reasons, and so we're a little slow on our production. We can only do so much. And right now we're in the middle of grinding, pressing, um, tempering, and we're not roasting or woodening today. We're going to show you what that process looks like. So, over here is our roaster. <laughs> Um, this is how we roast. So it's a drum roaster. We do this because we feel like drum roasting is the best way to control flavor. There's a lot of different ways you can roast. Um, we just like this one because of the flavors we get from the beans. Yeah. So again, I, I don't know why Instagram, I wish we could do it sideways, but we can. So we spend a lot of time working on roast profiles for the beans. That makes a big difference in the flavor. So when we get beans in to evaluate We'll do a lot of roasts, test roasts, see if we get flavors we like. And then once we decide that we like it, we'll go down there. We'll make sure that what's happening down there is something that is sustainable and um, is replicatable. And we'll bring it back here and we'll do a uh, test roast 30 pounds at a time because that's very different than doing a small roast. So we create roast profiles. It's basically a, basically a graph. Yep. Um, and then we hit the roast profile every time as we get the same flavors. There's also small variations between harvests. So Every time that we get beans in, we're always evaluating that. There's actually a small um, port oh, yeah. on the side of here where you can take a few beans out and, and taste test them as you go. So, okay. so once the beans come out, um, they get cooled on this cooling rack right here. Um, this stuff here is all made by Cacao Cucina in Florida. They do a really nice job with a small specialty chocolate making equipment. A lot of this didn't even exist 10 years ago because this wasn't a thing. So there's been a lot of companies that have stepped up and started making some really good products. I'm going to just turn the grinder off here so you guys can hear us better. So then the next step in the process is winnowing, and that's just taking the shells off the beans. So you don't want shells in your chocolate. Uh, it'll do all kinds of really ungood things. So this machine right here will take the shells off. So what happens is basically shells go on the top. The, the beans go on the top. Sorry, the beans go in the top, and then they come down, and there's a basically a big slide right here, and you've got these two things here, vacuum. So the beans get crushed when they go into the, see, that's, that's the international sign for crushing, um, and then they come down this slide, and the shells, because they're lighter, get vacuumed up. And there's different settings you can do to see how much shell you get compared to your nib, and you want to find a good balance. You don't want as little shell as possible, but you don't want to lose all your nibs. So, the, uh, the nibs themselves end up down here. The shells get sucked up into two different places. Let me collect the nibs, the nibs here. The nibs get collected here. And then that's what it looks like. And they get stored. I'm not sure if they're in the over there. Usually there's some right down here, oh, but... Yeah, we're, yeah. we're, we're on a di bit of a different production schedule right now. So, sorry, I just got a call. So just How long it. does it take... How long does it take to decide on a roast profile for a bean? Do you ever change it for a certain bean for harvest to harvest? Yeah, it takes a while. We do a lot of test batches with the beans that we get in to figure out what the roast pro profile is. Um, I don't know, 10, 15 different roasts. And we do it in a, a small little oven we have in the office over there. And um, it's fun. You know, you get to see what you like, but it takes a while. And then based on the harvest, that, that really, you, you do need to make modifications to your profile. So you have to just monitor it when you get new harvests in. So next step in the process is the grinding. So we have three grinders. Um, they're called melanders. They do a couple different things. They refine, which is reduce the particle size, and they conch, which is a process specific to chocolate, to aerating off certain volatiles in short. And so they're made they're, by the and they're made by um, yeah, DCM, Diamond Custom Machines. They also make small ones for home use. Definitely recommend them, they're really good and you can make your own chocolate at home. It won't be as good as ours, it'll be really good. <laughs> so, um, we put the nibs in here, and uh, again, there's different ways you can refine your chocolate. There's uh, ball mills, there's different ways you can do it. We like these, again, for the, the flavor control. Yeah. So, you put the nibs in, and I should have my gloves you should on. Have Hang on. on. So, you put the nibs in, and after a while, of grinding, the nibs turn into this liquid mass. It's called chocolate liquor, or cocoa liquor, excuse me, cocoa liquor. There you go. So we'll turn this on to show you kind of what the action is. 
So it's a stone, there's stone wheels in there, and there's a stone bottom. And the nibs get ground between those two, and they turn into a liquid basically because they're half fat. Half of the fat, the, co the fat is the cocoa butter. So, oh look, hi. Um, so the fat is the cocoa butter, and it's kind of like when you grind a peanut, you get peanut butter. And then once they're in there, the particle size keeps being reduced because you've got the stones grinding against each other. Um, after that, we hit our ideal particle size, we can control with these knobs, we can control the, uh, oh hey Raphael, um, the, the, uh, the size that we want, we can stop refining at a certain point and just conch. Now the conching part is what really develops flavor, and that's a, again a, chocolate, a process specific to chocolate um, invented uh, by Lint. And once that process was invented, was the first time at least people started eating chocolate. Before that, it was mainly in drinking chocolate. So how you conch, what temperature, how long, greatly impacts flavor. So we generally will load these grinders up at about nine o'clock, 10 o'clock on Monday morning, and we'll take it out sometime either Thursday night, Friday, or Saturday. It depends on the bean. And that's all about the flavor. Each the different profile. bean has its own conch profile, and that includes temperature, pressure, and of course, time. So, so turn uh, it higher so you can see what it looks like when it's fast. All right, so here's all the way up. And that's basically... Um, Have you had any sugar yet? Yeah, so this was um, ye yesterday. This was um, Monday. I added the beans, the nibs, the sugar, and the cocoa butter. So that's the next thing we want to talk about is we also have... Um, we also add cocoa butter to our chocolate, which is something that a lot of people... Um, will do, but the difference with what we do is we press our own cocoa butter. So that's one of the reasons we were a little, we were scrambling a bit to get this video ready is that our cocoa butter press, um, the butter, the butter press tube exploded. So we have cocoa butter everywhere, but that's part of the reason why people don't press is it is time consuming and it's a little difficult. So um, my husband and I discovered chocolate at Whole Foods last fall, by far the best chocolate we ever tasted. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this is the press, Monica's standing by it. It's basically, um, this big pot and we put cocoa liquor into the pot and then under really high pressure it separates the cocoa butter from the cocoa solids and it's the cocoa butter that we add back into the chocolate so on Monday when we add the nibs in there and we add the sugar in there we'll also add previously pressed cocoa butter from the same beans we use to make the bar Here, show it makes a this. really big difference so you can kind of see look at this here can you see like this looks like melted butter coming off it's gonna go on my hand soon look that's some of the butter that we were pressing that exploded today. And we also have over here. Oh, do you have it? Yeah, so we pressed, we got about half a batch because of the broken tube, but this is the cocoa butter. You see it's starting to solidify, it's getting cool, but this is what came out of the press. We call it liquid gold, because it is worth its weight in gold. Um, and it's a golden color, so really it's the perfect analogy. Uh, <laughs> and this is what's left in the pot after you press out the butter. So this is the cocoa powder, it's called the press cake. And this is just a big brick of solid cocoa powder. And we take that and we grind it up and we make our single origin cacao powder. We have hot cocoa um, of the different origins. So that's our cocoa butter. So next step in the process, yep. after the uh, chocolate is ready on Friday, we'll tilt these grinders forward and we empty them into uh, hotel pans and they get sifted. This is our sifter. So this will not smooth out your chocolate. If it's too gritty, if you haven't gotten a good particle size, it will still be gritty. But what this will do, it'll catch any radicals, which are the uh, tiny parts of the bean that would germinate if you didn't kill it with the fermentation. And so those are really hard to grind. Um, these grinders are great for flavor, but they will also give you a range of particle sizes. So it's, there's no guarantee you're gonna grind all your radicals. So this, We'll filter all those out so you don't get any crunches when you, uh, you bite into your bar. So, a lot of waves. Hi, guys. All right, so uh, we're almost there. So, next step in the process, after the chocolate's sifted, it then gets put into the tempering machine. So, this is the tempering machine here. Now, this is made specifically for chocolate making. Um, it is doing a process called tempering, which is basically creating a certain type of crystal in the cocoa butter. And that's what gives your chocolate that snap. It slightly raises the melting point. If you were to take a chocolate bar, warm it up, and then cool it back down again, it would still be kind of like fudge because you don't have the right crystals in there. So 
So this creates a certain type of crystal, the type 5 crystal. You can lift it up the top. Um, and this is the tank where the chocolate is held as it waits to be tempered. It can also, once we're ready to temper, <laughs> good sound there, um, we turn the depositing head on, and what we do is we warm the chocolate up to the point where there's no crystals in the chocolate, so above 115 degrees or so. And then we cool it down, we hit temper, and that will cool it down to the temperature range where your, the crystals you want will live. So it's a very narrow temperature range. Once you're in there, you should, theoretically, have the crystals that you want yeah. in your chocolate. So this here, the depositing head, you can set it to deposit a certain amount of chocolate, and they get deposited into our molds, which I'll show you right here. I just molded a tank this morning of Almendra Blanca, which we were almost out of. But everybody wants chocolate, so we're still making it. So we take our molds, and then these will just go under the depositing head, and they fill that up, and there's a vibrating table we use, and that smooths out the chocolate. And I think Monica was going to taste this. This is one of Monica's favorites. I love this one. You want to taste it too? Sure. Mm -hmm. It tastes so good right out of here. I wish we could make it exactly like this. <laughs> the heat, when it's warm, it just is so much more bright and flavorful. I love Almendra Blanca because it is so bright. It's like bright citrus fruit combined with some kind of creaminess. I love it. Um, a question about Boston Harbor Distillery. We'll definitely get to that in a second. So we'll just finish up in here. Um, the next step in the process, the bar is going to the next room to get chilled. Yep. But I'm going to show you one more thing, which is this is our... This is a Parmesan cheese grater. This is what we use to grate our cacao powder. So we put the chunks of the press cake in here, and it grinds them up into a powder, and then we add sugar and put it in a food processor, and that makes the hot cocoa. Yep. So. This is our testing area. This is where we do all of our test batches. Very fancy hair dryers and small grinders. <laughs> all right, so then the bars come into the next room and they get chilled down and demolded. So this is the chiller room. And this is our glass chiller. So we put the bars in here, they go in here in our racks in those molds, and it takes about uh, 25 to 30 minutes, they cool down. Um, this will also warm up chocolate, which is great for melting stuff for pressing and then other reasons. Um, but the bars come here to the table, and they get demolded right here. And I can't even put my hand in the right place, there we go. And they get put on trays. These were fresh out of the Selmi this morning. These are Almendra Blanca chocolate bars. All right there. Each tank gives you about 250 bars or so. Um, right now we're doing about 500 bars a week. More than that, but it's about all money and I can. All we can handle, handle in combination <laughs> with homeschooling right now. So. That's what it is. And the kids are learning a lot about chocolate. Yep, yeah, they're having a great time. <laughs> so two other things to show you in here. This is our cocoa butter. So we, uh, we, st we usually press uh, a few weeks in advance. Um, so this is the butter getting ready for um, the next batch. Carmen, ready for the next batch. And then uh, we also store um, our cacao powder in here. So one really cool thing to see with this is the difference. The cacao powder gives you kind of the same difference as the beans. It's really interesting thing to see is the difference in color. So if you look, this is, this, these two don't have as big a difference. Um, I'm going to grab an ukiyale, yeah. So you can see here, just the difference in color in the cacao powder, that's the genetic differences of the bean. It's a visual difference. Most of the differences are in flavor, but it just gives you an idea that you've got very different beans. So then final step, uh, we can take you downstairs. Oh, and these are all of our test bars, guys. All these different test batches we do, we always make our test bars. Yep. We have so, to yeah. taste test them. Yep, so we're doing, uh, as you can see, we're testing Working that. On a milk bar. Or a Klim bar. <laughs> yeah, backwards. Um, okay. The Boston Harbor Distillery. So um, you guys had asked about that. When we um, make our Boston Harbor Distillery, we make a rum and a whiskey bar. And that's actually what, um, I don't know, what these pans over here are for. So, We'll take the nibs and we'll put them in these big hotel pans and then we'll actually pour the whiskey into the pans. And the nibs soak in the whiskey for several, well, depends on, on which bar we're making, but at least a couple days. 
And that way the nibs soak up all the complex flavors of the whiskey. And then of course we have to dry them because you can't have any water in chocolate. So then we dry them for a couple days. So it's a really long, complex process. It takes about 52 bottles worth of whiskey for every batch. Um, and if Boston Harbor Distillery is on here, thank you guys for being so accommodating all the time. We just show up like, hey, can we have 50 gallons of whiskey, please? <laughs> so, all right. So let's um, finish downstairs. We'll finish downstairs. And then can ask questions. Okay. We'll just do a quick finish downstairs with the bars, and then uh, if you guys have any questions, as one of you just said, we are happy to answer. Well, just we'll show wrapping real quick. Monica's okay. in the process of, uh, of wrapping these bars right now. Oh, yeah. This is where I sit, and this is my project yesterday. Here we go. So we used to gold foil wrap, and then we switched to the sleeves um, for a couple reasons. One, it was just so much um, more time efficient, time effective to do that. Also, two, you can recycle the plastic now. Um, the big it, thing was it protects the barbs. Oh, yeah, that was a huge thing. We switched our packaging for, for protection. Before, we used to have foil wrap with white with paper around it. Now it's this harder paper protection because the bars were getting destroyed, getting to the stores and people dropping them and breaking and, and everything. So this, the bar is much better protective, and we have a much lower loss rate. And we currently wrap these in plastic. Um, we actually have uh, a oh, compostable yeah. material coming from China, it's been a bit delayed <laughs> for some reason. I'm know, not sure why. I know. But, so soon this will yeah. be switched. It won't be plastic. It'll be um, biocompostable material. So we're trying to be as sustainable and efficient and effective as we can because we really believe in all of that. So then if you guys, I mean, that's really, I think that's about it. So if you guys have any questions. Yeah, we're ready. Uh, <laughs> go ahead and ask. <laughs> um, can you tell us about your journeys to find cacao? How about Colombia in particular? Thanks. Oh, yeah. And um, Martino. Yeah. Want to talk about Martino? Yeah, that'd be great. So we work with um, Martino. He's amazing. Um, he works with a, a group of farmers in um, Boyaca in the region. What is it? It's San Pablo de San Borbor. Pablo de Borbor. Um, and there are a bunch of farmers there that are growing fine flavor cacao. It's actually really interesting. Uh, years ago, they were coca fields, and now they've change their farming and they don't obviously farm coca anymore they've done fine flavor cacao because they are realizing they can get um if they pay a little bit more attention to their crops and fermentation protocol they can earn more money for what they produce in fine flavor cacao so these guys are making great cacao paying attention to it we got to visit them last year walk the fields with them meet people it was amazing um yeah, and they're, I mean, again, this is a new thing for them, and we're the first chocolate maker to use their beans. So we encourage anybody who likes the Boyaca, it's it's out there, any chocolate makers watching, yeah. they're really great beans. Martino's really responsive, so we definitely would they're really would encourage delicious. you to use them. Yeah. yeah, honestly, I have to say, for my, my flavor palette, I really typically love bright, fruity flavors. I, I love acidity. And that bar, it's not a bright, fruity flavor. So typically, I wouldn't say I love it, but I do love it. It's so good. It's um, like toasty marshmallows with a little bit of cracker. I, I love it. It's so good. And we have a question from um, someone's seven-year-old son who says, how much chocolate do you make each day? Yeah. Very good question, seven-year-old son. <laughs> so we do it by the week just because different days, some, will make, some days will make none. It's, it's a process. Some days will make a bunch. Um, it's just, it's a, a long, you know, day, but it takes many, many days in a process to end up with bars. So we usually will make about a thousand, um, yeah. to 1500 bars a week, depending on the bar. Yeah. Right now we're down to about 500 just because it, it is just the two of us. Yep. Just the two of us. All right. And so we'll just check to make sure Any we didn't more questions? miss anybody. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that Chaco Institute. What did thank you, you say? Do. Okay. Where, where to buy our bars. Oh yeah, we have a shop at the Boston Public Market, but it's not open right now because of everything being closed. We're so yeah. sad. This is a really hard time for a lot of, of independent retailers and, and restaurateurs, and we really support them. And I know we're all just struggling and figuring out what the new way forward is, and I know that we'll be able to find a way to support everyone. 
And definitely, look, we are just one of many great chocolate makers. We encourage you guys. I mean, obviously, uh, we would love it if you would, uh, you know, purchase our chocolate and if you enjoy it. Yeah. Um, but there's also great makers like um, French Broad and Fruition yep. and Letterpress. And go to their websites. Yeah. Go and, and try some of their bars because they're making excellent craft chocolate, too. They're sourcing in the same way we are, yeah. um, ethically, from the farmers. And the really cool thing is some of us use some of the same beans. So yeah. you can compare. You can buy... An Esmeralda bar from French Broad, and buy one from uh, Dandelion, yep. and everybody's will taste different. Different. It's, it's really cool. cool. Yeah. It's really fun. We yeah. actually do that a lot. We yeah. do staff tastings where we bring in bars and we all check out what everyone makes. It's really fun. Hey, it's a. Uh... Oh, hi, Tati. <laughs> All right. Well, um, that's, anything else? It, I think that's about it. Make sure it, right? there's nothing else here. We didn't miss anybody's questions. Um, thanks for the tour. Great. Greetings from Chile. Love your Esmeralda's bar. Thank you. Awesome. A bowl of chocolate. Really cool. Yeah. All right. If you guys have any other, oh, did you build your own press to extract? No. So the press is from again Cacao Cucina, our yeah. roaster, our press. If you're looking for equipment, we definitely encourage you to reach out to them, to Diamond Custom Machines. Um, they both make specific machines just for chocolate making. And um, they're great at customer service. And also, they'll customize machines for you. That press yeah. up there is very different than when we first uh, first made it. It has like double the capacity. So and it's a lot easier to do the turnaround, except for the occasional, you know, explosion. But I mean, it just <laughs> yeah, always okay. happens. So anyway, um, thank you very much, everybody, for tuning in. We hope everybody is, um, is well and staying safe. We really appreciate you taking the time with us today. If anybody has any questions, you can email us yeah. anytime. Info at goodnowfarms.com. Check out the Stay Home with Chocolate website for more great programming. And um, please support all your local businesses uh, to the extent that you safely can. And eat good chocolate. <laughs> Have a great day. Bye, guys.